I think we've uh, put together a superstar team of uh, individuals who can talk about when patients uh, take over. What does it look like? Bill Gall probably is a patient, but I don't know of him as a patient. I know of him as someone who tells extremely bad jokes. <laughs> and also, and also as uh, the leader of a absolutely breakthrough program called the Undiagnosed Disease Network, where um, they took patients, they take patients who have been refractory to disease diagnosis for years, and by applying a combination of the best practices in genome sequencing and the right experts putting their eyeballs on the patients, they're able to achieve unbelievable rates of diagnosis. Also present here is Matt Might, who keynoted last year. And Matt, um, in addition to the journey that he's had with his family um, and participating, I should say, as an advisor for the Undiagnosed Disease Network, has uh, recently uh, been drawn by virtue of his expertise into uh, work for the government at the White House specifically and also with the uh, Veterans Administration. Eric Minical and Sonia. Uh, I first met Eric when he was applying to uh, a graduate uh, program at Harvard. And uh, when he explained to me that he was doing it for very personal reasons, which he will talk to you about, I promptly uh, fired him from our uh, graduate program so he could actually go to a better program at Harvard, which would have far less requirements because he was already smart enough to uh, not have to do some of the things in our program. And it's a very uh, interesting journey in that respect. Allison um, is, works with a company that is very much centered exactly where you've heard some of the talks uh, today and has, as a result, had to take a very innovative eye towards what does a clinical trial look like? What does validation look like? How do you involve the patients in this? And I think we have a lot to learn uh, from Allison and Ultragenics in this sense. And with that, I'll shut up and hand it over to Bill. Okay, thank you very much. Each of us is going to give about five to seven minutes of an introduction, and I'm going to let each of the panelists here describe their background uh, as well. And I'm going to uh, start out by telling you a little bit uh, about myself. I'm the clinical director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. I'm also the director of the NIH Undiagnosed Diseases uh, Program. And I study metabolic and rare diseases. So this is going to be largely a panel about uh, rare diseases and how we can come to diagnoses. Now, precision medicine actually requires a diagnosis to begin with. So how do we get that and what, what is the problem? in this country, in this world, with people who have rare diseases and are relatively abandoned because they don't have a diagnosis and live their lives in some measure of desperation because their colleagues, their friends, and their relatives, and their employers, and their employees, and even their doctors don't understand what they have and can't offer them a community in which to live and share their experiences. So this actually began in 2008. And actually, May 19, 2008, we announced this program to bad advocacy groups and to the press. <clears throat> and after that, it really burgeoned. The reason being that there were 6% of all the calls that came to the Office of Rare Diseases in the office of the director of the NIH <clears throat> by patients who, instead of having rare diseases and asking for help, actually had no diagnosis at all. So this uh, program started with $280,000 that was infused from the Office of Rare Diseases to my office uh, to start an undiagnosed diseases program. And so I hired two nurse practitioners and a scheduler. And then it got a lot of press and uh, basically couldn't be stopped because the NIH was uh, essentially shamed into continuing it after it had all the press. So this is sort of what happens with the federal government. You have to, instead of asking for permission, you have to ask for forgiveness. And, we did. And actually, Elias Serhuni supported this enormously. And I, I can give you numbers uh, at some point. But let me tell you instead how this program works. It would actually be much better if I could show pictures of patients and tell you their stories because they're absolutely gripping. But instead, I'll give you some boring numbers. 
So what, what patients do is they apply by sending their medical records. The average medical record is maybe this big or so. We've had about 4,000 of them over the last eight years. We've accepted about 1,000 individuals. <clears throat> and in addition to the records, of course, we get their images and their biopsy slides and things of that that are really important. And then for the adults, I look through these records and triage them to some of the experts in the intramural program of the NIH. And Dr. Cindy Tiff for the children does the same thing. We get back some sort of a, uh, an opinion about whether this is a really good case, a unique case. And then if it's really good, we s s um, accept the patient for a one-week inpatient stay at the NIH Clinical Center where every patient is on a research protocol. This is rather an omnibus type research protocol. So they uh, consent to uh, certain things. <clears throat> and then we're able to get our consultations from our experts while the patient is an inpatient and in fact are able to achieve probably what it takes one year to two years to do on the outside because as an outpatient that requires insurance, you have to get one test done before you can get the other test approved, et cetera. So we don't require any insurance uh, and we uh, provide everything for free, essentially. So we've had these 1,000 patients or so and made maybe a couple hundred to 300 diagnoses, but we also have about 100, maybe more, maybe close to 200 patients who have unique diseases that we've been able to phenotype in an extremely detailed fashion <clears throat> and also uh, get uh, genetics on. And we are able to get uh, family exomes and then do an analysis uh, of this. So we have about maybe 100 or 200 cases which we consider to be unique new diseases and their data are contained within a database which we call UDPix, and this contains all the phenotypic data using an ontology called phenotypes and also the exomic data uh, of those of the patient and the family members <clears throat> and this is able to be uh, searched in a reasonable way so we're looking for those new diseases and one of the main issues here is expanding so that we can find second cases because essentially the scientific and medical community doesn't believe that there's an association between any variant, no matter how well it segregates, no matter what the functional studies are, any variant and a human disease unless you find a second patient who has a variant in the same gene and has the same type of phenotype, the same phenotype. <clears throat> so we need to find second cases. So the uh, NIH thought this was a reasonable enough program that they invested more money in it and for fiscal years 13 through 20 invested $145 million for s those seven years to expand this program to six other clinical sites around the country, a coordinating center which is located uh, here at Harvard and Zach actually runs, <clears throat> and as well as two sequencing centers, one at Baylor and one at Hudson Alpha and a metabolomics core and a model organisms core and we also have some money for functional studies. <clears throat> so that expansion is going to allow us to share uh, data and find second cases. There's also an expansion to an international undiagnosed disease network international and countries in, uh, well, first of all, the, uh, the country of Australia, Austria, Italy and Japan all have undiagnosed disease programs now and there are many others that are establishing that them as well and we can share information uh, in this fashion. So that's uh, critically important. We should know that the diagnosis is critically important for a new disease and once one person has a new disease, then many other patients are found to have the same disorder and now you have a community in which the natural history can be determined and Matt Might is going to tell us uh, about that. One other outcome of this <clears throat> is that drug companies are very interested. Drug companies are interested because the mechanism of action of these new disorders, first of all, is definitely pertinent to humanity and to human beings because there is a patient associated with it. That's not always true of the R&D that drug companies perform. So that link is already there. And secondly, if you find a mechanism with a target that's druggable, it could very well have application to common diseases. And I 
believe that that's the motivation for most of the companies that are interested. We now have associations with Pfizer and with Regeneron, and there are many other companies that actually have some interest. So <clears throat> I, I guess the final thing that I would mention here is from my perspective as a member of the uh, federal government, I like to think of you know, going down to Louisiana or something and saying, you know, I'm with the federal government, I'm here to help. And there's sort of some truth in that in, in this case. So the, what the NIH is able to do is to establish natural history studies because after all, that is a prerequisite now of anything that the FDA sees. They want to know for sure that whatever positive result you have associated with your intervention could not have happened by itself. For example, in neuroblastoma, where some of the neuroblastoma in kids will spontaneously regress and the patient will be completely cured, the FDA will always say that could have happened in your disease, unless you have natural history studies to demonstrate that that's not true and to show the course uh, of the disease. So the NIH can do that if there's an intramural investigator and she or he is interested in that disease enough to bring the patients in for free and document the natural history of the disorder. The NIH can also intramurally do proof of principle studies uh, for drugs that are discovered to have a certain mechanism of, of action and uh, begin the process of bringing this to market through a, a pharmaceutical company. So what we really do is we'll patent something and then basically give the license away for almost free. And the reason that you have to do that is to provide exclusivity for a drug company. Otherwise, if it's in the public domain, nobody's going to pick it up. So, so that really is the point. So this is the beginning of a, I would say, an international effort for sharing information about really rare disorders, new disorders, and discovering new mechanisms of action for eventual uh, development of uh, targeting drugs uh, towards that. And now you're going to hear something from uh, some of our colleagues who are experienced in their own right with some of these really rare and uh, new disorders, and then uh, something about how drug company addresses the issue of rare diseases. So Matt, why don't you take it away? Uh, maybe tell us just a little about yourself uh, first. Is that, a, is that sure. all right? Um, well, yeah. So if I may introduce myself. Um, I'm Matt Light. You, you want to do it there or you want to do it there? I can do it up there. Yeah, so a brief introduction. Um, I'm Matt Might. Um, I have a grade school education in biology, and I'm here to tell you about precision medicine. Um, <laughs> uh, and since I now work for the White House, I'm required to put a disclaimer on pretty much any talk I try to give because the communications office eyes sort of glaze over when I, when I show them what I'm about to say. Uh, my statements may not reflect the positions or policies of the president or the administration. Some of my statements may, but I'll leave it to you as an exercise to, uh, to figure out which are which. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story, a story that illustrates what it means for patients to engage in therapeutics development and ultimately what it takes for precision medicine to succeed. Uh, that is, I'm going to share what it takes um, for, for what it to, to really deliver on this mantra of delivering the right drug to the right patient at the right time. What does it mean to actually execute that in practice? And I'll tell you the short version right up front. Uh, it's, it's going to take collaboration for precision medicine to succeed. It takes clinicians and companies and government and academics working together and really being led by or pulled by patients to pull this off. So let me support that claim with a story. This is, in fact, my son's story. Uh, after my son was born eight years ago, he really baffled doctors. He had seizures, a movement disorder, and extreme developmental delay. Um, and he also had some unusual symptoms, like the fact that he does not produce tears. I mean, he can cry, but tears do not come out of his, uh, don't come, come out of his eyes and roll down his cheeks. And any time we try to put this constellation of symptoms together, we just could not get a diagnosis to fit. There was just nothing we could do. In fact, after four years of searching for answers, searching for a disease, we ran out of known diseases to even test for. So we partnered with scientists at Duke University and who were willing to peer into my son's genome for an answer in much the same way that they, you know, entities like the Undiagnosed Diseases Network now do. Uh, and you know what, they, they actually found the answer. They found two mutations in a gene called NGLY1 that had caused this disease. And then came a bombshell revelation. My son was the first and in fact only case ever, ever known of this particular disease. 
And, and certainly as a parent, that's kind of a shock to hear. You know, no parent, I, I think every parent wants to believe that their child is unique, uh, but this is a degree of uniqueness that I was certainly unprepared for uh, when he was born. But alas, you know, we, we had a diagnosis, we had an answer, and, and Dawn had broken on this long night of uncertainty. And right away, we knew we couldn't do this alone. We knew we had to find other patients, but the doctors told us that th this disease was so rare, based on the, you know, the frequency of these pathogenic alleles, that it could take us decades, potentially, to find another patient. Now, what these doctors didn't realize is that I have a secret weapon. I am a professor in computer science. Uh, and what this means is that I am borderline functional as a human being, but I do know how to use Google. <laughs> so I took my son's case to social media with a blog post and got it to go viral. Uh, before I knew it, patients from all over the world were finding us. And four years later, we have 54 patients from around the world uh, that are confirmed cases of this disease. And they hail from literally every continent except for Antarctica. Uh, but even Antarctica gets the internet, so I'm sure we could find them there as well. Uh, and that's when the NIH stepped in. In fact, it was Bill who really stepped in. Bill brought these patients to the NIH uh, for extensive evaluations. And he said, uh, and, and, and as a result of these evaluations, we now have a very deep understanding of a disease that no one even knew existed just four years ago. And the question became, can you translate this understanding into treatments? And I think in precision medicine, the only way to know is to do. So we, we just kept going. Over the past three years, I've shifted about half of my research from computer science into medicine. And I've been learning an awful lot. Um, I've, I've learned from a, a glycobiologist in Japan named Tadashi Suzuki that really understands the, the metabolism behind this particular gene and who's able to educate me on some of the implications of what's, what it's, happens when it's missing. And Lynn Wolf at the NIH, who's actually you know, coordinating the, the, the research going on there, uh, gave me a lecture on inborn air, um, disorders of inborn, uh, inborn errors of cellular metabolism and you know, giving me a sense of how you might actually go about treating some of these. So putting it all together, I hypothesized that my son was shortened a compound called N-acetylglucosamine. And the interesting thing about this is that there's another secret weapon you can use, uh, which in this case was Amazon.com. It turns out you can buy this compound for about 25 cents a day uh, and take it. So I took a bottle of it myself, and I didn't die. Um, so at this point, it seemed reasonably safe to give it to my son. Um, and this is because in, in my household, I really am the FDA. Um, now, I, I, have to, I have to warn you that this is where the, the communications office said, uh, I should probably re remind you that this is not, not actually official administration policy. <laughs> Just my household. Um, but when I gave this compound to him, something really remarkable happened. He cried. Uh, and more than that, his, his nighttime seizures went away virtually entirely after about three months. Uh, and when I say he cried, I mean tears were rolling down his cheeks for the first time in his life. And so I did what any parent would do. I, I actually collected his tears, packed them on rice, and shipped them to a lab in California for analysis. Um, but we, we didn't stop there. Um, and in fact, I got really lucky. About a year ago, I picked up a research grant to do drug discovery for this disease. And I'm trying like crazy to spend all of that before they remember that I'm a computer scientist with only a grade school education in, in biology. So I've been working with a pharmacologist at the University of Utah, <clears throat> and we hired a postdoc to create worms that actually have my son's disease. And using novel insights from this Japanese glycobiologist, we actually found a way to cure those worms. And about a couple months ago, working with a, a, a geneticist named Clement Chow, we found a way to cure fruit flies of the same disease using a slightly different mechanism. And uh, uh, Tadashi, the, that Japanese glycobiologist, can now cure mice, again, using the exact same mechanism. So in the past year, we, we've been able to cure worms, flies, and mice. Um, of, of this disease. And there are some differences, as it turns out, between worms, flies, mice, and humans, uh, but this is certainly encouraging. And it gives me the hope that we are, we are on the path, and maybe by the end of the summer, could, could actually be there. So it turns out there's a second gene uh, for, that if you suppress it, what you have this disorder actually reverses much of the phenotype. And so the next step was to find a drug that can actually hit this gene and inhibit it in some way. And this time, the secret weapon really was computer science. Um, so we've been using a computational screening technique called docking simulations, where we're looking for m small molecules that are inverse and are the complement in terms of shape and charge for the, the active site of this particular second gene uh, so that we can, we can shut it down. And it, this is sort of a strictly computational technique. And when we, we, check test, when we you know, simulated hundreds of thousands of compounds going through this, um, you know, trying to fit into this pocket, we felt, what we found is about 70 of them seemed to fit. They seemed to be able to shut this thing down. And more remarkably, about 14 of them were already FDA approved. Um, so at this moment, we found this literally about three months ago. We got, the, we, got, we got these answers back. So at this very moment, some very brave worms and some you know, arguably less valiant mass spec machines are testing these compounds out to see if any of them might really be the cure for, for my son's disorder. And I, I think by the end of the summer, we're likely to know which may actually be it. Uh, but ultimately, really curing my son is not enough either. I think it's, it's important that we as a, as a community 
uh, give every patient the hope of treatment. I think that's actually a moral imperative for us as a, as, as a research community is to give every patient that hope. Unfortunately, about a year ago, Zach asked if I was interested in joining the department as a visiting professor. As it turns out, the only way to answer that question is, is yes. Um, so I spent a lot of time here over the past year uh, working with Zach and Rachel Ramoni and Kim Splinter and many others trying to construct a vision, and really not just construct, but enact a vision for clinical precision medicine. And for finding treatments, I'm, I'm actually proud to let you know that uh, the Harvard Med School, with, with Zach's leadership, along with uh, the University of Utah, Boston Children's Hospital, Recursion Pharmaceutical, and Paranomics, have actually banded together under a patient-empowered precision medicine alliance, or what we call PETMA, uh, to act as an entity that can en enact this, en not only represents, but enacts a vision of clinical precision medicine. What we're trying to do with this alliance is make sure that every patient, no matter who they are, has a next step to take on their diagnostic journey or their therapeutic journey. That's what this is all about. So that every patient really does have hope and every patient has a next step. And the way we've constructed this alliance is so that no matter what stage of the journey you're on, you have a place to go, whether that next step is compound screening or variant interpretation or medicinal chemistry or clinical trials, we will help you take that, that next step. And for the next year, we're, we're actually, we're sort of in the next year now, we're, we're running a pilot study. We're taking a handful of relatively novel disorders and seeing if we can run this entire process all the way through from you know, disease, uh, diagnosis to clinical trials, again, in the span of about 12 months, that's what we'd like to do. And while those results are preliminary because we're only about three months in, they're highly encouraging. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that nine months from now, we'll actually have some su success stories to share. Uh, so I believe that by bringing patients, academics, companies, government, uh, and, other, and providers to the table, we actually have an opportunity here. And it's the opportunity to do what it takes to deliver the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Now let's have some introductory remarks by uh, Eric and Sonia. And maybe tell us a little bit about yourselves to begin with. Thanks. Um, so we're Sonia and Eric. Um, we're a married couple. And the reason we're here and the reason we do what we do every day is that four and a half years ago, we were handed a diagnosis. And it's a story similar to Matt's in some ways, different in some ways, because what we were given was a diagnosis for me at a point in my life where I had and continue to have no phenotype. But what we learned was that I carry a mutation that very reliably causes genetic prion disease in midlife. And what that disease looks like is you have no symptoms for this variable amount of time, but then as soon as you do, you experience this incredibly rapid neurodegenerative decline that is fatal within weeks or maybe up to six months. So that downhill is very, very steep. Um, and we know it firsthand because we watched this happen to my mom in 2010. So at the time that we were given this piece of paper, we were doing really different things with our lives. I was trained as a lawyer. Eric was working as a city planner. Um, but this ended up being a catalyst for us to change everything around. Um, we went back to train in biomedicine from the ground up. We, as Zach alluded to, we started a PhD program here at Harvard Medical School in 2014. We're really lucky right now to be based at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, where our job description every day is to try to develop therapies for this disease. Um, so that is all, um, it's in some ways a story of great fortune. We're really lucky to be able to work on this. But uh, the four years that have you know, sort of elapsed in this, in this quest have really sharpened our thinking on just how many obstacles there are, not all of them scientific, and it's, um, it's daunting. Thanks. Um, so as we've made the transition over the last four and a half years to working in the lab on actually trying to do the science of developing a molecule that we would think deserves to be a drug, there is no molecule like that out there right now. We hope to invent it. Um, we've also started looking down the road to once we have that molecule, how do we actually get it to a point where it can do benefit for patients? Um, and uh, this is where I want to invoke something that uh, Matt said to us the other day that he didn't mention in his talk, which is, you know, rare disease has certain advantages over common disease. And he used the example of HDL cholesterol. So HDL is correlated with cardiovascular outcomes, but turns out not to be causal. And if you modulate HDL, it does not affect, uh, it, at least it, lowering HDL, uh, raising HDL does not improve cardiovascular outcomes. Um, 
So that's the kind of uh, complication that you can run into in common disease where there's many things that are involved, uh, many environmental and genetic risk factors, and so on. Um, our disease is rare, arguably, because only one thing causes it. Um, so our disease is monogenic. Uh, in your DNA, you have a gene called the prion protein gene. That encodes for prion protein mRNA, which encodes for the prion protein itself, which is present in all of your cells right now. Normally, it's a well-behaved, properly folded protein. And then every once in a while, there's this extra step beyond what the central dogma of biology is supposed to be, which is that protein then misfolds, and that misfolding can spread across the brain and cause disease. So that is the disease mechanism for, for our disease. And so you have to believe that there's a much higher prior than there is in common disease for something like HDL. It has to be the case, for example, that if we lower the amount of the prion protein that you produce, that has to be beneficial because this disease is caused by a toxic gain of function. If we can prevent the protein from misfolding, reduce the amount of misfolded protein that you have in your brain, that has to be beneficial. So I think um, generally knowing what your mechanism is and that in a way it's a simple process and you know, um, you know what the disease process is. Um, and in our case, it is also very well modeled in animals. Um, I think these give us certain advantages in doing the science and coming to a compound that we think is helpful. Now the question is, how do we turn that into actually making it easier to get a drug to a point where it can help patients? Right, so this is where we have all these advantages. We have this known target as we're doing the science in the lab. But what we've come to appreciate is that that next chapter, the thing that comes next once we have a preclinical candidate that we really believe in, that is sort of the great mystery and, and unsolved hurdle um, in a lot of important ways. I think there are a lot of ways in which rare diseases can band together, and there are also ways in which you know the biology of each disease is unique, and here we have what I think are some unique challenges. Um, when we're ready to do a clinical trial, we think that all the science suggests that we're going to be trying to do it in asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic individuals like myself, who have these mutations that are, you know, extremely predictive of this fatal disease, but who don't look like they're sick. And I think we need to, you know, create a paradigm in which those people are empowered to take on risk and enroll in a trial, even though to the naked eye they look completely healthy, and no one can say when that disease is going to strike them. Um, another way in which, you know, we will have a high bar is that these patients are few. This is going to be a small N trial, and we think we probably won't have the luxury of a placebo control cohort. We want to be able to treat everyone we can find, and maybe that means doing some sort of staggered start or on-off pulsing or some other sort of like creative trial mode where we can generate meaningful data without having, you know, huge numbers. Um, Finally, we think that this is going to have to be a biomarker-based trial. And the reason is the onset for prion disease is age of onset is extremely variable. I could get sick next year. I could get sick in 30 years. Um, we just have no way to know. So it just doesn't seem feasible or realistic to design a trial around watching people for decades and decades waiting for some stochastic process to arise. And then when it did, what's the counterfactual? What you know, how do you know that you moved the needle on at what point in their life that was going to happen? So what we need instead is to build a case around what Eric was describing as the central dogma of this disease and find biomarkers where we believe that modulating them will have a clinical impact that we circle back to. So to kind of sum that up, I want to paint a picture of where we'd like to be five or ten years from now and what our challenge is then. So we hope that the work we're doing in the lab now will lead to us, you know, five or ten years from now, having a compound that either lowers the amount of prion protein that you produce or keeps it from misfolding. Um, and then we want to be able to administer that to patients, take a sample of their cerebrospinal fluid or some other fluid, um, and show that we have either reduced the amount of protein or we've reduced the amount of misfolded protein in that tissue. Um, that is the best we can hope to do. Those are both biomarkers that, by all rational mechanistic understanding of what our disease is, those have to predict clinical benefit. But we just don't have time. We don't have the decades and decades that it would take to A, demonstrate clinical benefit, or B, prove that those biomarkers predict clinical benefit based on experimental evidence in humans. So therefore, this has to be good enough. Showing that we've moved those biomarkers has to be enough. And so when, when we get to that point, we're going to need FDA to be right there with us and say, yes, we understand this is how your disease works. 
this means that your drug can be approved and we'll circle back over the coming years and you know, then you can show that indeed these patients got sick later than they would have and so on. Um, and uh, more than that, what we need is a, a signal right now that that is going to be the reality five or ten years from now. Because, you know, in order for us to get to that point, we can't do it alone. We're going to need investment from pharmaceutical partners, grant-making agencies, philanthropists, you know, and any reasonable person looking to put money into this is going to want to know, is there really a path uh, to getting a drug approved? Um, so, so, so that's what we need, and thank you for listening to, to our story and our, our particular problem. Thank you very much, Sonia and Eric. I think you really laid out the issues, probably for the whole field, in an incredibly uh, moving way. Um, and also the importance of knowing the mechanism of action, uh, which is really you know, part of the basic research uh, issue here. So our next speaker is now uh, Allison. And Allison, maybe you could tell us a little about yourself and then uh, talk to the um, industry's uh, relationship with rare diseases. Okay, my name is Allison Skreiner. I am a developmental child psychologist by training. I specialize in the assessment and diagnosis of cognitive and motor disorders. Um, when I finished my graduate studies, um, I immediately went to work uh, in the field of rare disease about 15 years ago. And I knew when I was doing my studies that I would um, pursue a career in rare disease. Um, the reason why uh, this, I, you know, I feel like is, is my calling, is that my father is one of five children. My grandmother had those five children, three of whom died of Tay-Sachs disease uh, by the age of three years. I remember going down to the University of Pittsburgh with my mother and my grandmother and getting tested. Uh, lots of vials of blood. It was fun time with my mom and, and my grandma, and we always went to the original hot dog shop down the street in Oakland, and uh, you know, I, I realize now um, that doing all that testing and, and uh, being part of that process, you know, I was a warrior. I was acting on behalf of uh, my aunt and my uncles um, who lost the fight with the disease. And as my grandmother, she never mentioned um, her children who, who were deceased by name. Uh, but as she became older, uh, she started to lose her faculties. And she started calling my sister Jeannie. And I later learned that Jeannie was my aunt. Um, and my sister looked just like Jeannie. And having never heard her name and have seen my grandmother at the end of her life, Still, with a hole in her heart, 40 years later, um, at the loss of her daughter. And all of a sudden, all those trips to Oakland made me realize that, that I was just fighting the war with her. She had lost her children, but we were fighting for other children. And so that's why my career is based um, you know, on rare disease. Um, I am acting on behalf of my family. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because, you know, it's hard being an industry. We are a business. Um, we are developing drugs, and we do have to get them reimbursed um, to keep a sign on the wall and, and to fuel the research and development of other drugs. Um, but the campaign that I am fighting is on behalf of the patient, making sure that the patient is always represented in the research. Um, and one of the things that, that I am passionate about is incorporating the patient in the clinical trial design and the selection and development of endpoints so that we can get these drugs approved and make a case for a clinically meaningful change in health status. Um, the way that I do this is actually something that's, you know, uh, a little bit not frowned upon, but I would say people are fearful of doing an industry which is having contact um, with the patients. I don't see any way around this. Um, the best source of information is the patient. The patient drives the approval of these drugs. They are the single most important critical factor because only they know what they experience. And so I rely so heavily, when I go to FDA and we present a clinical trial design or present an endpoint, I feel confident in doing that because I've actually gotten all the information I needed from the patient. 
One of the things that we'll do is we'll get a central IRB approval, we'll put together a protocol, we'll put together a consent form, we'll engage a physician or an academic institution, and we'll actually test patients. Um, for our g and &E myopathy program, I've conducted a pilot study all in accordance with GCP principles, we are, you know, patient confidentiality was maintained, but I actually was able to develop an endpoint that was based on muscle strength data that I collected from affected patients. Um, we have doing the same thing. Um, I developed a radiographic endpoint for the evaluation of change in bone disease um, for X-linked hypophosphatemia, another very rare metabolic um, condition. Um, every single one um, of our programs has patient-driven endpoints. Uh, I think this is the way of the future. Um, there is nothing that I could read in a book. There is nothing I could hear from a treating physician that can replace the information that I get when I just do basic clinical observation and lay hands on a patient, when I test their muscles, when I test their cognition. Um, and so that is... I see the most important role that a patient can play in the drug development process is all the way back to the beginning, even before you file an IND. You are, as a patient, you're in possession of all the knowledge that industry needs in order to get a drug um, to market. So everything that I do, um, I feel like, you know, every time I go to the agency, I feel confident. I, I feel like we are developing products that are patient-centric in their, in their clinical development process so that when we go to the agencies, we're actually representing change in terms of something that's clinically meaningful to the patient, to the physician who would be prescribing these drugs, to the regulator who has to approve these drugs, and to the reimbursers who have to pay for these drugs. But it all comes back to the patient. As I said, there's nothing that I can read in a textbook that's gonna take place, to take the place of that clinical observation. I need to test you. I need to hear what's hard for you to do in a day. Um, I need to hear how your disease evolved over time. And this also goes back to the natural history um, of these diseases. It has to start early. It's never too early to start collecting data on the progression of these diseases because you know a lot of people see value. If you could do nothing else than to keep me exactly where I am today, that would be valuable. But unless, if, if all I can do is stabilize you, I have to be able um, to show that. I have to be able to show that what would have happened in the absence of that treatment. So yes, everybody wants a cure, but a treatment may not bring you back to your original condition. It may just keep you where you are today. And you know, we all want the ultimate outcome. Um, but I remember one of the G and E myopathy patients that I worked with when we first started studying this, and he said, you know, and I said, what are your expectations for treatment? He said, I just want to dance with my daughter at her wedding. And, and I thought, okay, okay. You know, I, I wanted to keep, I had all these lofty goals. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, I am going to keep you where you are today. And if I get more than that, that's great. But if that's all we can do, then, then baby steps. Um, and I think that, you know, in, in doing these rare diseases, the patients have to provide us with information of the disease, but then it goes one step further. Once we've designed a study and we have endpoints, somebody has to go first. And there's a lot of risk associated with that because the thing about these rare diseases, it's very, it's very uncommon to be able to do a study with healthy volunteers, right? We do the best preclinical work that we can to show that a drug is safe, that we have an idea of what the toxicity is, what the dose is, but ultimately somebody has to be that first human guinea pig, and you have people who are in a very vulnerable position where there's no other treatment, um, and we have to also do our due diligence, um, but ultimately it has to be the decision um, you know, of, of the patient and their family with approval of the regulators. Um, but one of the things I do want to say today is in my 15 years of working in industry, I have noticed um, a lot of collaboration with the regulatory authorities. They are becoming increasingly open um, to novel approaches, to study design, to working with rare disease companies. Um, they're extremely uh, collaborative. A perfect example is we were developing a drug for MPS7, mucopolysaccharidosis type 7, SLY syndrome, 
we were well underway um, in trying to get our phase one, two study up and running um, when a case um, that we had been following for quite some time, the boy became extremely ill and he was not going to live long enough for us to complete that required study. And we had to file an emergency IND. And the first in man was a child um, that was in a very, very compromised position. And we did get that emergency IND approved. Um, and that boy is still with us and has made great strides um, on treatment. But that was a huge risk um, for all of us to take, for the FDA to allow us to do it, for the patient's family to allow us to treat him, and for us as a company. Um, but, you know, we are all in this together, um, and I'm finding that it is a very, very, it's become a community. Um, and things have really changed, and they're going to continue to evolve over time. But I have noticed a, a big difference in our ability to collaborate um, together. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Allison. I have really three quick comments. One has to do with the gene myopathy, which is a late onset muscle disease due to insufficient synthesis of sialic acid, a terminal sugar that's charged uh, on glycoproteins and glycolipids. In any event, we did a study that uh, involved giving intravenous immune globulin because that has a lot of sialic acid on it, so you're actually delivering it. And uh, just four patients, open label, et cetera. But two of the things that happened with these patients are, one, a woman was able now to come touch the back of her hair, pull the back of her, of her hair down. And another was able to flick and make some sound here. So, okay, this isn't so important. This may be a good outcome measure, possibly though, because it takes some strength to be able to do that and make a sound. But this small little thing about pulling your hair down like this is an activity of daily living that we all accept as normal and easy to do. When you get impaired to that extent, it's an activity of daily living that means a lot to you. And there are all sorts of these things that our patients receive, that, that, that our patients are unable to do, that they're able to do if you give them just a little bit more uh, help with it. And that means the, the world to, to folks. People who don't have uh, enough neurotransmitters and are unable to stand up from a chair and now you give them neurotransmitters and they're able to get up from a chair within 13 seconds instead of seven minutes, literally. Those are the types of things that make a huge difference. The, the second thing I'd mention <coughs> is that there probably is a difference between rare disease pharmaceutical companies and larger pharmaceutical companies that delve largely into oh, common diseases for markets of $2 billion or more a year as opposed to the rare disease companies. And, and the rare disease pharmaceutical companies often have a, a personal interest in this, as you saw uh, with, with Allison, and also the people who um, are sort of the administrators and the, you know, the funders of, of rare disease companies. And the f final thing I've mentioned is that, to me, precision medicine is not just genomics. It's, it's not just next generation sequencing. I think that nowadays, next generation sequencing, exome sequencing, genome sequencing, is a component of precision medicine. But to me, in the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, precision medicine means physicians and healthcare workers meeting together to discuss a case and getting all the information that can be obtained and talking with each other about the best way to proceed. This is a group effort, and it isn't just basically selling genomes to people to, to uh, make a, a commercial buck. So uh, those are my comments. Now, uh, Zach has given us at least three e extremely good questions to address. And I've decided not to address those right now. <laughs> because I, and I think we will cut off questions in a little bit. But I would like to give people the opportunity to ask questions now. And then um, we'll address these questions. Because I think that your issues may be uh, a little bit more germane to this group than uh, just having us talk among ourselves. Is that, is that fair? So anyone can come to the microphones and ask anything of any of us. Yep. Well, we
we may be stuck with Zach's question. <laughs> so, I guess my question is for from uh, for Allison. So, in some ways, you have to be publicly very nice about the FDA because they're going to uh, review all your uh, products. But you just told us about a trial in which uh, this was a patient who was close to death, and there was a risk that the patient would have taken the drug and died, not necessarily because of the drug, but because they were too far gone. How did you justify to yourself as a company, uh, or as a member of that company, the risk that you might be destroying the whole market for that drug by that failure? There, w there was considerable risk. I mean, there was a risk that we would be on, on clinical hold and, and if the patient were to succumb because it would be very muddy as to whether or not that was due to the drug um, or the course of the disease, um, given that this patient did not have um, that long to go. Um, but the thing about it was we had done a tremendous amount of preclinical work. Um, we had reason to believe that this was efficacious um, and would be safe if administered properly. And while uh, mice aren't men, uh, we felt confident that we knew the right dose. So I feel like it was an informed decision, definitely risky, um, but we had done our homework ahead of time. Um, and because of that, we were in a position to actually start the phase one, two. So timing, timing is everything. Um, basically, this patient uh, was located in the U.S. Our phase one, two study, uh, which would have been the first in man, was going to be in the U.K. because we still had some tox work to work through um, for the FDA, but we had gotten it approved um, in Europe. So we were going to do that while we were completing some of our work um, in the U.S., but we were, we were really close. Did your uh, lawyers say anything about this? Well, that's the beauty of being a tiny startup at the time. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't have, a, we didn't have a official general counsel. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely, absolutely a risk. So that was my point. In other words, small startups don't often have attorneys. But if you, boy, if you try to go through a big pharmaceutical company, yeah. well, I mean, we have a hell of a time just getting an MTA. Yeah. Uh, this is a very unique situation, but I, I use it as an example of how things have changed. Um, because if that situation had arisen when I first started working in the rare disease community, the answer would have been absolutely not. Um, but the patient was, was making an informed decision. We were, and so were the regulators. But yes, I think a lot of it has to do that we were small, getting ready to start up a phase one, two, um, and willing uh, to take the risk. Yep. Uh, Mr. Birch. Yes. Uh, my name is John Birch. I'm an angel investor researching healthcare data. Uh, and uh, just a really quick comment. I, this morning there was a lot of talk about precision medicine, primarily genomics, and data mining of that w together with other data. But it seems to me, Eric and Sonia, you particularly are illustrating an, a missing dimension to precision data. To uh, which is the longitudinal aspect. It has to be both deep, which would where the preciseness comes from, uh, and long. Uh, in other words, uh, your, your, your genomic data, as it is at this case, uh, is very going to be very relevant for a diagnosis you're likely to have in 10 years or whenever. Uh, I'm aware of a number of other conditions where, uh, and I'm no expert, um, but I've heard of a num number of other conditions, apparently, for example, perfectly healthy men in their, in their 50s come down with, with heart, heart disease. Uh, and the only thing, they've, or the main thing they've been able to correlate that with is uh, whether their mother was exposed to lead in the second trimester. Now, that, I, I think I've got that right, uh, but I think there are many other examples of data that should be collected during the ch childhood years that are relevant to healthcare conditions later on in life, but that's not collected at all today. And it certainly, even if it were collected, isn't used by, you know, by, by physicians later on in life. What do you agree, I guess, that the longitudinality is the missing dimension to precise medicine, as we're precision medicine as we talk about it? And what are your thoughts, any of you, uh, as to what might be done about it? Go ahead. Um, thanks. I 
We think a lot about the sort of like longitudinality of what we're trying to do. I think in our case, you know, and this is just luck, we inherited a whole lot of information about prion disease because a lot was known in our disease in our field. So the you know, correlation between the variant that I carry and other like pathogenic variants in this particular gene and these neurodegenerative diseases in midlife was very well worked out and established when we came along. Um, but I think a dimension of um, a way in which we think about sort of longitudinality in, in our work is that at the point where we you know, have an intervention and want to treat people, that is going to be a process that we have to you know, follow for decades. And I think we have to really rethink how a very sort of long treatment course grafts onto the regulatory process and patient access to experimental drugs. Um, what would you say? Uh, I think that's great. I, I, the only, I guess the only thing I would add is um, I don't disagree with anything you said, but I think in, in many conversations about precision medicine, and I'm, I'm very grateful that this conference is an exception that's actually themed around rogue therapeutics, I think often the missing dimension is how do we get drugs approved for these diseases? Because it's very, it's, I don't know, it's easier to have a, con you know, diagnosis has improved so much with XM sequencing and all these things in the last 10 years. Um, it's easy to have a conversation that's just about diagnosis and about discovering more genetic associations and stuff. Yep. But at the end of the day, what patients want is therapeutics, and that has too often not been the focus of conversations about precision medicine. I think longitudinal studies, too, are inherent in natural history studies. And I also think the precision medicine group uh, funded by the NIH is going to start following some of the kids. Uh, okay, next question. Hi, my name is Aaron. I'm with Nate. And uh, my question is, you know, something that Matt and, and I think Eric alluded to about, you know, in one way being fortunate to have a rare chronic disease. And I'm curious about precision medicine in regards to some of the diseases that are more like a blanket diagnosis like autism or like cancer was 40 years ago, where autism may be several hundred different diseases. We just don't know it yet. And if we continue to treat it as you know, a blanket diagnosis, we may never know which ones affect specific children, which ones do. Just love to hear more about you guys thinking about that and what the language is that's being used in this space to describe that problem. Be helpful. Yeah, so I think uh, you're absolutely right that you know, diseases like autism, they're not a single monolithic disease. There are, there are actually many, many diseases with a somewhat common phenotype. Oh. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, so diseases like autism, they're, they're not a single monolithic disease. There are, there are a number of diseases with many different genetic causes that have been lumped together because they have a common phenotype. Uh, and this, actually, I think the same thing is very true of cancer. You know, you, it's, it's really many, I mean, in fact, you could almost argue that every cancer is, is really its own rare disease. Um, and so I think that's why we really need a scalable process for clinical precision medicine so that we can go from, you know, a disease-causing variant and map that into the therapeutic that's appropriate for that disease-causing variant. I mean, that's, and we have to scale that to the point where we could do this on an individual patient basis over and over and over again. Um, we're, we're not there, but I think that's, that's the end point. That's where we have to get to with clinical precision medicine. Well, and I think that uh, some disorders are multisystemic but include autism as part of it. And if such a disorder is monogenic, then you have a chance of determining the mechanism by which that gene's aberration causes the autism portion of the disease. And if, if that can be done, then that uh, mechanism can be applied to more common causes of autism. And that's why we believe in rare disease research. And, sir. So, hi, I'm uh, Michael Zhang. I'm going to be a student at Harvard College in the fall. And my question to Matt is in regards to kind of the government's role in the short term, uh, specifically with your position in the Executive Office of the White House, how do you see that in guiding progress and activity towards achieving goals in precision medicine? Uh, that's a good question. And let me reiterate my disclaimer okay. that I'm not here in an official capacity. So, uh, nothing I say is true. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I think the government has a huge role to play in accelerating precision medicine across the board. And if you look at what they're doing right now uh, with the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative, they're really laying the, the scientific foundation for the precision medicine of the future. And the way I put it is this. What, what they're trying to do with the Precision Medicine Initiative is enroll a million Americans 
get them genotyped, and collect their longitudinal phenotypes o uh, over time so that we can start to, to construct these gene disease environment correlations so that we know that this particular gene or this particular variant has this effect on human health. Because uh, you, you, right now, as it turns out, if you, if you get genome sequence, as actually was quite recently, we can't tell you what most of the variants you have are doing to you. Uh, and we really need you know, a large number of, of people to actually be able to figure out what these variants do in terms of human health. And so that, that's a big, critical first step in being able to actually conduct clinical precision medicine, to actually build that data set so that we can say, this is what your genome is doing to you, and this is how we can respond to it in terms of your health. Um, and that's, that's really the biggest component right now uh, that's going on at, at the federal level, is, is this precision medicine initiative. Um, oh, I, would, I, would, I would actually also argue that I think you know, the forerunner of the precision medicine initiative is really the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. I mean, I think that is, in terms of clinical precision medicine, that is, that is it. That is, that is sort of the Navy SEALs of medicine right now. Um, and, and they're really defining the process by which we try to understand what a mutation is doing to us um, or, or doing to a patient. And that's, that's really that first step in, in, the, in, in the process. Um, I, what I'd like to see, you know, again, because I'm not speaking in official capacity right now, what I'd like to see more at the federal level is, is funding for defining this framework for what, what do you do if you're a patient and you need to actually figure out how to find a treatment for, for your disease based on your genome or your broader omics data now. I think that's, that's where precision medicine is only headed, is beyond the genome. We're looking at all kinds of big data related to a patient. Uh, and today, there hasn't been a, a very large effort in that direction, uh, but I hope that will change. Thank you. Th thank you. Sir? I'm Cole Lyman, uh, intern at Harvard Medical School. And I understand my, that my question is quite broad, but what are some different first steps that a patient with a rare disease could take and how do you see that changing in the new future? Do you see it becoming easier as more programs are developed? Or what is your kind of outlook for that? Yeah, so if, if you watched my talk from last year, I, I called it literally an algorithm for precision medicine, um, which now exists as a, as a somewhat lengthy blog post to, sit, to take a patient from you know, where they, wherever they are in their current journey, which even if they're undiagnosed, it'll say your next step is probably some kind of sequencing. If you're sequenced, then it'll say, okay, well, based on the kind of mutation you have, what's the likely next step for you? Is it a gain of function? Is it loss of function? Is it, you know, uh, haploid insufficiency? And it'll start to recommend therapeutic strategies based on that. And I, I think, you know, where we're headed ultimately with pre precision medicine is what I would call algorithmic medicine, <laughs> where data goes in and either treatments or experiments to run come out as your next step. I think one of the challenges, though, is, is, is the other side of it is, is splicing and dicing it in such a way that, you know, if you have a disease and you have 135 known mutations from an industry perspective, if the mechanism of the disease is the same and the clinical presentation, the features of that disease are relatively common, we have to find a way to put everybody together, otherwise we'll never be able to do the type of trial that's large enough that we can actually get a disease. Um, you know, a, a drug approved. Um, so we are, you know, face the curse of having, you know, statistical power issues because we have small numbers of, of heterogeneous patients and then within that they all have different mutations and a slightly different clinical presentation. So we have to try to find the things that they do have in common so that we can study those things. Um, and hopefully uh, show change. And one of the best ways to do that is if you have natural history data, then a patient can essentially serve as their own control. Um, and you can have that long lead-in period where you can study them in the absence of a treatment and then put them on treatment and actually, you know, show that to be the clinically meaningful um, change that can get, you know, that can lead to, to the approval process. Yeah, I think that that's on us. As and as far as the patient goes, though, collecting your own records, mm -hmm. being your own person uh, in charge of that, yeah. and going to a tertiary medical care system uh, are really important to so make sure that you've you know, done all of the things that medicine has to offer now, and then the undiagnosed disease programs for people who don't have a diagnosis. But I don't see those things, those, at least the first two things, changing very much. I think it's always going to be important to have your records mm -hmm. in good shape and to uh, go to tertiary care center. I'll just yeah, add one small thing that I think Matt speaks to you better than any of us, is the power of finding each other on the internet. And I think that's just getting easier and easier. We're in the process of trying to create a registry for our disease where people can just gather, even if there is no action item immediately, 
um, you're prepared when there is one. It's an incredibly powerful thing. I mean, um, at Ultragenics, uh, we designed an online survey um, be, to get as many people as we could to tell us about their diagnostic history, their medical history, their surgical history. Um, and we actually designed our clinical trials based on that. We selected a patient-reported outcome measure, and I felt confident doing that because I had data from 195 adults using that instrument that we pilot tested. 195 is, is a gold mine to us. Um, and so going into a clinical trial, and we had had some regulatory communications, and they recommended the instrument that we had pilot tested, and you know, thank goodness we actually tried to pilot test it, otherwise we might have been put in a position where we would have to go in blind. Um, but we had that information, but it was only because those patients banded together, had formed um, a patient advocacy group called the XLH Network. Uh, we can't recruit patients directly, uh, but we, they allowed us to host the survey um, on their network, and we got that information in a very short period of time, and we got it from 14 countries. Um, and we've since launched it in five languages. And so that information went all the way to helping us characterize the disease. It helped us find patients and their treaters. It helped us design a clinical study. Um, and ultimately, it will help us um, in getting the drug approved in the various countries uh, registered um, and reimbursed because it's actually got data in it that goes all the way from their diagnosis to the impact that it has on you know, functional activities like, you know, snapping their fingers or, or, or reaching in the back of their head because it is that, it's more than this, it's washing your own hair. And, that, and, and if you can't do that, then you're relying on someone to do that for you. Yep. You know, snapping your fingers is also the same as being able to write your own name. So we're pretty much, uh, will not do a clinical trial unless there's an advocacy group. Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Jessica. I am an undergraduate student at the University of Southern California working here for the summer. And I believe some dimensions of my question may have been covered by the previous two, but I imagine that time is really of the essence when you're trying to develop treatment for a rare disease, especially if it's as personal as it is for some of you guys. So I was wondering what you guys thought of the existing frameworks and regulations that may perhaps be obstacles with regards to the timeliness of these, treat uh, th these developments and what thoughts you may have on how they can be improved to become more efficient. Would anyone like to address that? Sure. Um, I don't know why I wore this today. Um, so me Again, not an official capacity. I think there's, there's a lot of room for improvement uh, at the FDA. I think the randomized uh, controlled trial process is, it, it, it works very well for large, large diseases and common diseases, but it is to a total failure when it comes to the ultra-rare diseases. And it's becoming and will become a major bottleneck in getting therapeutics approved going forward. <laughs> or, or at least tweet it anonymously if you do. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I we're getting an explosion in ultra rares in the advent uh, in the aftermath of, of genomic sequencing. Uh, these are diseases with only you know a few dozen patients at most, and the problem is you know at the FDA we sort of live under the tyranny of the p value, and and that tyranny will kill all of the ultra rare diseases because we are never going to get the statistical confidence that they require for approval with the patient populations we have. That's just a fact, um, and so we're going to have to move towards you know more individualized, more end of one style trials for regulatory approval. I, I don't see any other way to ultimately help out these communities. And the, th the great thing is, is if, if, we, if we pilot that with the ultra rares, we can take those techniques back to the more common diseases and hopefully have a better approval process for everybody in the end, unofficially speaking. I mean, we do have a phase three study with 12 patients in it, so, so I know, think your fingers comment, crossed, but it, it, it's coming. It's slow, but it's coming. Yeah, I think your comment, Allison, about the FDA sort of changing its culture and philosophy is absolutely correct, but it is slow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other, other comments, okay? okay. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, w something we think about is that the process of linking a biomarker to a clinical outcome, like actually demonstrating experimentally that when you change the biomarker, you change the clinical outcome, takes forever, and that's, that's time that we don't have. Um, you know, and, and if you look at policy, you know, that with accelerated approval and orphan diseases and stuff, um, there is this notion that the FDA could approve a drug based on a biomarker that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Um, but, you know, having the confidence that that's, that 
that what you eventually show them is going to be deemed reasonably likely is a hard thing to have in advance. And so it becomes hard to convince, you know, pharmaceutical partners and, and, and people who you want to partner with um, that they should take a leap on you. Um, you know, there's also, there's, there's a lot of paperwork at every step of it and a lot of um, regulatory delays and things. And um, I'll also mention, you know, sort of on the scientific side of how do we get to a molecule that we would then take to FDA, um, there's a lot that we could do, uh, be doing better in terms of, say, sharing of, you know, patient samples, data, mouse models, things that another researcher has developed that nominally they are required to share with us if we want them. Um, but when you actually go after them, it just takes years and years to, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's. The FDA has the authority to use its discretion in things. It's their choice whether or not they use that discretion. Katya. Um, I, sorry. I'm uh, Katya Moritz from Undiagnosed Documentary. Um, and one of the issues that I wanted to ask you guys to talk about is how can we unify uh, patients uh, and advocates so we can have more impact in the policy, right? Because if rare and undiagnosed uh, get together and we can uh, put more pressure, for instance, I always say that uh, confidentiality is a privilege that the undiagnosed population can afford and the rare disease population can afford. So talk about more open and out there people, uh, very rarely use people come to a, anywhere and talk about their conditions so openly. So how can we capitalize on that and uh, get a unity together so then we could take over and really make changes in policy more concerning with timing? Because people don't see their ti our timing the same way as they see a patient with cancer and an understood condition. Um, there's, you know, six months for someone who has to have an answer can, can be appropriate. So how can we make a change as a, a combined effort? Um, I'll just speak to one aspect of, of what you just said, which is sort of people coming forward with their conditions or their genetic information and trying to take a stand or move policy. I think something that we've faced um, is patient fear, um, especially like in pre disease or other adult onset conditions where you might have your genetic information but be really afraid either to receive it yourself or for anybody else to ever find out about it. Um, so I'm just an N of one in this context, but like part of what we've done is to make ourselves guinea pigs, being in the public spotlight with this fatal mutation very, very publicly attached to my name. And for what it's worth, in this tiny experiment, it has only been helpful. It has only opened doors for us. It has never been used against us. And you know, fingers crossed that that continues to be the case. But I hope that as more and more people are holding genetic information that does have you know, meaning to their health in the present or in the future, um, we will all collectively have more confidence to you know, step forward with that. And you know, we have some, not all, the genetic discrimination protections we wish we had. The only way we're gonna get more is by banding together for them. So. I, mean, I think that, that you know, the patients need to understand the onus is on you to educate us. Uh, because the, regulator, the regulators, they don't know, no one knows these diseases. These diseases are one question from your boards that you took a quarter of a century ago. Okay? Um, so we need that information. We need your records. We need your history. Um, and, and that is the patient's role in accelerating the drug development process. If I have all your records and I can show that in the absence of treatment your bones don't change and then I give you a drug and they heal, then you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, but I need those pictures. Um, I, you know, if I, we have a drug, it's intended to help you grow, I need to show that your growth velocity was well below what it should have been prior to starting treatment, and now I've got you actually on a curve. But again, uh, without those records, we can't make that case, and then what that means is a longer trial. Right, and everybody want, and then the other thing that's so important is that clinical trials are such a huge burden. They're extremely expensive from our perspective, but we do recognize the burden that they place on patients and, and families. It's a, it is a long, arduous process for people that are already barely, you know, keeping things going. Virtually every patient that we've had in the undiagnosed disease program wants to tell her or his story and uh, publicly, and Matt Mites sort of example it tells you how much you can get if you're uh, willing to put things on the web. And he's actually helping many of our patients do that uh, in the network. I'd also say that as we move to the network now, we have a common IRB, and that IRB allows us within the network to share identified information, patients' names, among ourselves, 
because the consent form asks for that and the patient signed that consent form. And they're basically willing to because you know this is the rare disease community and that's the difference between the rare disease and the common disease community. Sir. Hi, thank you very much for a lovely uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Stephen Pollack. Um, context, context as we all know is enormously important in healthcare and biology. We exist in a context, context for the present, context over time. Uh, we've talked a lot about genes, and what I'm interested to hear in your terms of your work and in terms of the rare diseases is the other aspects of the context. So for example, uh, we can talk about uh, our flora, the microbial context. We can talk about epigenetics, and I'm curious in your work about how complicated you're beginning to find what you thought was, perhaps I'm, I'm misplaced my thinking, but the thought was simply a one-way genetic uh, condition, that there are other things in the bio biological system that are influencing, impacting the phenotypic expression. Thank you. So, so in other words, we have the environment, then we have our own microenvironment in, in terms of our microbiome, and we also have modifying genes affecting the uh, single, single gene that we ordinarily attribute disease to. Can, can I, I, let me just elaborate a little bit more. One of the difficulties I have with precision medicine is it always talks about genes. And 15, 20 years ago, that had been great. When I did my PhD, that was great. We thought it was all one way. Uh, but that's not the way the world works. Now, we're influenced by our environment. In fact, we're far more adaptable as a species because of epigenetic factors, because of microbial factors, a whole range of things within our own current generation. And undoubtedly, that has to be affecting also uh, these rare diseases to some greater or lesser extent. Of course, the, the big issue is how do we begin to identify those, okay. those differences? So are there comments on this? Uh, I will have a comment if they're not. Um. Uh, yeah, well, I, I would say that, you know, uh, pe some people think that precision medicine and genomic medicine are the same thing, but they're, I think precision medicine is really big data-driven medicine, um, where you can take any kind of data, whether it's the EHR, or your genome, or your transcriptome, or your metabolome, or environmental factors, and use all of these in the treatment of the patient. And it, I, I think the reason we focus on genes right now is that the genome is, is here at a, at a clinical scale, that people are getting it in large numbers for the first time. Um, but that other modalities of data are arriving just as rapidly, and that ultimately, if precision medicine succeeds, I think what we'll find is that you know the the greatest drug of the 21st century was data itself. Okay, other uh, Sonia, did you want to mention anything? Um, maybe not. I think my answer, at least as regards our disease, will be disappointing to you. Mostly, I just think. Um, Every disease is so different, right? And I think that the answer to how much of that complexity needs to be embraced in order to meaningly, meaningfully modulate the disease is going to be different for every disease. Um, so I think, you know, in our case, we do have a really good monogenic target. We do have this protein that we know if an animal doesn't have this protein, they absolutely can't get prion disease. There's nothing you can do to infect them with prions. Um, and we also have the challenge of, you know, very small numbers of people to do any, like, larger omics to look for more complex factors. Um, but I think, as you said, context, like, every disease will be different in this regard. Yeah, and I would, I would basically agree with you that there are other influences. And, uh, but it, and I definitely agree with you that uh, it depends on which disorder it is. So, for example, if you have galactosemia, there's a huge environmental impact. If you avoid galactose, you will never have the disease. So, but if you take galactose, you will have uh, severe cognitive delays and uh, you know, infertility in females and blah, 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 blah. The diseases that we're dealing with largely are diseases in which one gene is actually killing a human being. And so there's this huge effect of that gene and then virtually no or almost no environmental effect. But there are ones in which the environmental effect is uh, you know, equal to the gene. So I, I think context is a very good way of putting it, context of the disease and the gene. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Allison Marsden from Stanford. Um, I have a bit of a devil's advocate question, which is, you know, we all, I think, agree that uh, doctors typically shouldn't treat members of their own family who have a disease. Um, and so I'm wondering where we draw the line in terms of 
you know, if you're doing research on something that affects either yourself or your child, how do you maintain scientific objectivity or also enough emotional detachment to just get the day-to-day -day work done? If you could share your thoughts and experiences on that. So I, I think this is a really interesting question. We've been asked, like, how do you avoid sort of conflicts of interest and maintain objectivity? I, I think we have, like, the least conflicts of interest of, like, anyone working on this disease. I mean, not to malign them, but for us, like, having a paper about something is, you know, some of, some of these sort of coins of the land of academia are, like, simultaneously very understandable and totally mind-boggling. And like, these are just, they are not things we care about except as means to an end. And I sometimes think, you know, if we can push this forward without having, you know, papers, without having colleagues think we're brilliant, without getting credit for anything, that will be better because we will know that we were not distracted, we were not wasting time chasing those things as ends in themselves. Um, so I, I sort of think like we're just like, I don't know, deeply on mission and like if something isn't working, we'll be the first people to throw it away yeah. for what it's worth. Yeah. Matt, do you want to address that? Sure. sure. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, I feel very similar that, that we are sort of very, sort of the least conflicted when it comes to uh, understanding and treating these diseases. Um, however, there, there is a sort of a, a a, a strong desire that comes from hope that what you're working on is, is going to work when, you, when you're dealing with your family members. And certainly this happened with, with my son when we saw him to start to cry tears. And I said, well, is this just a coincidence or is this real? And so we had to come up with a little protocol to determine whether or not this effect was real. And what we came up with was, okay, well, we'll put them on and we'll take them off. We'll put them on and we'll take them off over and over again. And, and as we saw the tears go away and come back, we said, okay, well, this seems real to me now. Um, and, and you know, I think we were very motivated to develop this protocol because we really wanted to know, was, was this effect real or was it in our minds? Um, you know, I, I think you would find the same for most of the patients that are working on their diseases or uh, family members that are working on, on diseases related to their, their family members. But it's, good, it's a good point because we have seen advocacy group um, folks who have, let's say, possibly interfered with a good practices, let's say, and uh, also um, may have advanced their careers as part of their own family members' disorders. It's really sort of sad. Sir. Thank you, everyone, for your, for your time today. Uh, my question is, is about maybe threshold. So for example, in the undiagnosed diseases program, if you were going to apply and to use the examples laid out earlier, and you had years of chronic pain and an inability to pat your head or snap or something like that, would that reach the threshold of application to the undiagnosed diseases program? And then to extend that question to data, is there a threshold that you're, you're looking for in what is worthy of data to be collected uh, in general? Well, there's roughly speaking no threshold for applying. <laughs> in other words, that's the, uh, the popularity of the program is because anybody can apply. And believe me, looking through these records, anybody can apply. <laughs> so that's why we reject about 75% or so. But what we're looking for is objective evidence of impairment. And by that, I mean something like an, an, a radiogram, uh, you know, an image. Uh, CT or MRI or a biopsy that shows a abnormality or a, a physical abnormality growth or a laboratory finding, et cetera, some objective evidence, uh, as opposed to someone saying, oh, I have, I have pain in my joints, I know I have pain in my muscles, and uh, I feel sleepy and fatigued, and et cetera, et cetera, which we get a, a, an awful lot of. So uh, again, those, there's, uh, there's a threshold to acceptance, which is different from the thre thre threshold for uh, application. You, you had a follow-up question, it was about? So it was more about, you know, when, when, as you're looking for data and, and as people apply, is there a, uh, a threshold for which applications that, um, um, produce data that is collected and analyzed separate from acceptance to the program? No. In other words, once they're accepted, 
We collect all those data. When they're not accepted, we have a room that's filled with their charts, which we actually keep for eight years now, et cetera. We plan to keep it for a long time, but actually don't use. OK, thank you. Sir? Hi, uh, my name is Dick Benick uh, with Harvard Medical School. I just had a question uh, regarding the panel's uh, opinion. I wanted to also thank you guys for uh, really giving a life example of what it is to be a citizen scientist. Uh, the question I had was based upon um, the thought of citizen scientists out there in the world uh, uniting on the internet and kind of finding each other like you guys did, but for non-rare diseases. Uh, some examples would be um, birth control, uh, people who have sports injuries or bo um, bodybuilding injuries or stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to know what the value you see in um, utilizing the knowledge that are in these internet forums uh, to codify that in some way or get statistical uh, information and bring that, even though it's not rare disease uh, cures, but it's helping a lot of people. Uh, for example, the birth control concept uh, there are, for, uh, I found out just recently, there are forums out there with uh, women sharing their uh, reactions to one birth control versus another and all the side effects, and they're having extended conversations on what worked, what didn't, and they're actually trying to find other people who have had the same responses and sort of like what worked for them. Yeah, it's, it's crowdsourcing, knowledge gathering, and trying to extract information okay. out of that. What do you guys see uh, the future of that Take that? Well, as a computer scientist, I think there's tremendous opportunities to, to mine these, the reams of data available in patient communities online. I mean, there's, there's a lot of knowledge in the patient community that d is never going to be represented in, any, in, in the near future in medical texts. Um, but that's, it's actually, that's, that's a hard problem uh, to go out and actually mine all this very unstructured data and make any sense of it at all. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It's just a, it's a hard problem. Okay. Thank you. I think one way that I would look at this is that in the rare disease community, there's a huge need for folks to get together and share their information. Um, whereas in, for common issues l l like that, you can actually read a lot about it in many, many places. So maybe the, the value of the, the citizen scientists working on rare diseases is a greater increment over what we have now than the crowdsourcing would be for some of the other more common issues. That's just, just an opinion. Yes. Uh, just a quick follow-up to something that Matt said earlier and putting it together, though, with what you were saying, Bill. You, Matt, you talked about algorithmic medicine uh, and thinking that somehow in the future we're going to rely more and more on algorithmic tools. Uh, I, I just, I guess, two things. One, I want to point out that, that that's part of the holy grail that a lot of people think we're moving toward, but perhaps can never reach, but I, I, I think we can reach it but we have to be very realistic about what it takes to do that. Uh, we're talking about, as I said before, data that is extremely deep and extremely long. The algorithmic tools to go at that data are gonna be very complex AI-based engines themselves. And to, to monetize an industry of such next generation clinical decision support, let's call it, uh, we have to have large standardized databases of millions of Americans, if not hundreds of millions of Americans, so that we can actually create an industry to create those algorithmic tools. I, I, th I think that's just an economic reality. Bill, my, tying it together is how, where, where does intelligence come from to design the, 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 the rules, the, the, the AI that's in those expert systems? It's going to come from your research, I believe, and I guess to some extent from the PMI and a variety of other sources. Where do we stand as a medical health community? It's a medical science community in being able to collect the data from healthcare and the learning health system concept, apply it into the, the design of those new AI-based tools. If the standardized database were to exist today, could we even go at it? There's another delay that's going to be probably 14, 15, 17 years, you know, in creating those kinds of tools. Or am I, am I wrong? I hope I'm not so pessimistically. I hope that pessimism is not accurate. Well. I'm in the intramural program, and I do what I just told you I do. <laughs> and there's also the Department of Health and Human Services, which does what it does, and all those government agencies, and I don't know crap about that. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what's gonna happen. 
I, th I agree with you that <clears throat> things take forever, especially when there are people with interests over privacy. And so I don't see policies changing a whole heck of a lot over the collection of data and the mining of data for the general population, you know, very soon. I see things changing in the rare disease community in terms of sharing of, of information and people being more willing and the IRBs and ethicists understanding that. But this is not a government, you know, policy decision o over which nobody has any, uh, you know, uh, influence. But it does require scientific knowledge. That's really my question. Okay. So again, not my field. <laughs> okay, I think this is one last question, and then I'll have like a couple comments, and we'll finish in three minutes. Hi, uh, Tom Ulrich. I work at the Broad Institute. Hi, Eric and Sonia. Um, question about eventual pricing and cost. I mean, what happens when you come to the day where you've created your, you found your pathway, you've got your molecule, you've got your drug, the results are really great, and you come to find out that it, to produce it and distribute it is going to be so expensive that nobody in your communities is actually going to be able to afford it. Uh, what kind of discussions are happening among the community now to sort of address the, the concerns about cost? I mean, we were talking about it earlier. Um, with the, ex the example of Zivaldi, um, where the cost can be so high because the market, and I don't necessarily want to shoehorn you guys into being a market, but where the market is so small. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a problem we would love to have. <laughs> but, um, hopefully you will. <laughs> hopefully we will. And what would you say about uh, I mean, I Look, it's a hard problem. I don't, yeah. I don't have a magic bullet for you. I, I, I don't think it's fair to say that when drugs are expensive, no one in the community has access to them, right? I, th I mean, I think uh, we, we have Obamacare. People have insurance. Insurance will pay for these things, even when they're $300,000 sometimes. It's a battle. I know. It, you know, there end up being some people who can't get access to them. Um, and, I, you know, there, there are programs. We could talk about things, you know, uh, you know, Vertex and the, the CF Foundation making an effort to get to get Clodico to patients who can't afford it. Um, but it's it's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, and I don't know, I guess I think we're just focused on doing the science to develop the drug and then try to get it approved. So um, companies do help out. Yeah. And insurance companies uh, do pay for even very expensive uh, drugs. It may be a national problem, a policy problem. But I would uh, caution people to remember that the reason that companies develop rare disease drugs is because one company made a whole hell of a lot of money on one of them. And that actually played into the decision to, uh, let's say, reconfirm the orphan drug bill when, when this was debated, this very topic was debated in Congress. If I could add to that, just, yes. just briefly. Um, yeah, so there, there's, there, again, people are often assuming that we're going to develop a, a de novo drug from, from scratch for every disease every time. And I think, particularly with rare disease going forward, we're going to see a tremendous shift towards repurposing, towards taking the existing FDA arsenal, which I think uh, is sort of vastly underutilized, and, and figuring out how we can adapt it to rare diseases and other common diseases. I mean, I think if you look at sort of, um, you know, disease and chemical space, it's highly unsaturated right now. There's a lot of data points we haven't discovered yet. And what's it's exciting to me is, is the research moving into figuring out how to map um, existing drugs to new diseases. I think uh, there's going to be a lot of effort in that space. Because if you get a hit that's in the ex 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 existing arsenal, obviously that's much cheaper than developing from scratch. And I think more and more going forward, that'll be the case. Okay, so to wind up, I just mentioned that rare diseases are very different from common diseases, and we have to have different criteria for working in this space. In particular, with respect to randomized controlled trials versus N equals one trials, in, with respect to uh, sharing of information and holding on to privacy, and finally, with respect to the Food and Drug Administration holding to rigid criteria for preclinical studies and clinical studies, as opposed to looking at the risk-benefit ratio and uh, accepting, let, let's say, uh, surrogate markers and uh, evaluating patients who don't have any symptoms yet. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists.